Right. Well, this is what I got for you today. Um, we're going to finish up a little bit of stuff from last time that we didn't quite get to, which was mostly the section about alkaline. And then we're going to talk about the marine carbon cycle. So this might be review or it might be new stuff. Um, but to recall, we were talking about some stuff about like, like chemistry of seawater. I mentioned freezing point depression. I also wanted to just point out the you know, pH of seawater and um, you know, which we know ranges around 8.1, 8.2 for the most part of the world, at least in the surface ocean, a little bit more acidic with depth. And um, in addition to the carbonate chemistry, which we've talked about kind of uh, ad nauseum, plus photosynthesis and respiration, all of which is going to be part of the carbon cycle discussion today, which is important. There's a couple of other acids and bases in the ocean that are important. And one of them is the boric acid, borate anion couple. It's got a pKa of about nine for this reaction. It doesn't look like a traditional acid because it's a Lewis acid, but this is behaving like an acid, you can reach for. And that pKa is about nine. So, you know, we know that at about 8.2 for a pH, that um, mostly we're going to be, uh, you know, in the form where we're in the acidic uh, instead of the basic. But this, this is one of the things that contributes to the pH of seawater fairly significant. That plus the, the role of calcium carbonate formation and precipitation uh, shells by organisms. I'm just going to make sure we're still okay over here, which we're not. I always forget to set the view to speaker. Can you record it? Oh, yeah, it's already recorded. It is, yeah. So um, that's just kind of a reminder. We'll talk about how the pH changes subtly as we go through. There's another thing which people think about all the time, which is the charge balance. And I mentioned this previously when we talked about conservative and non-conservative ions. Um, this is like a sort of an average charge balance using typical salinity of seawater and the um, known ratio of all the conservative ions and how they kind of sum up. And you can see here that the important anions play a significant the carbonate and bicarbonate, a significant part of the charge cell. And um, there, are, there are other ions that play a role in here as well. But everything that we talked about today with respect to how respiration and photosynthesis and the formation of calcium carbonate shells, et cetera, um, affect aspects of water mass are also linked in with this. So there's a kind of a complicated interrelationship that keeps the ocean chemistry kind of the way it is. We've also already talked about currents. I just want to remind you of them. This is a slightly more detailed map than I showed you before. These are the surface currents, what we call gyroscopic flow. We also have deep water currents, which we'll, we talked about before, which we'll also talk about. But I kind of want to highlight for a second that all of these, you know, what we call eastern boundary currents, the stuff that happens on the eastern ends of oceans. The California current is one well known one, the Peru or Humboldt current is another well known one. These are places of especially high um, ecological significance within the oceans. And we'll talk about why um, that is in a moment, but it's primarily driven by upwelling of very nutrient rich water from the deep water up into the phototone that occurs there. So we've also already talked about um, you know, various aspects of what sets water density, um, a combination of temperature and salinity and so forth. This is just a, a sea surface salinity map showing you where the oceans are really salty in the gyres um, and where it's less salty. And there's a couple of things that you can see here. One, the Pacific Ocean isn't as salty as the Atlantic Ocean. That's a kind of a well-known difference. We're talking about the surface, surface layers. And there's a lot of chicken or egg in this. Why is that the case? Um, part of it has to do with the larger ocean basin, smaller ocean basin, larger area to receive precipitation, um, which helps dilute uh, seawater concentration relatively large area of evaporation, especially in the northern Pacific adjacent to the Sahara. These are the kinds of things that contribute to that salinity difference. Um, but if you recall, 
superimposed on the temperature difference uh, or temperature variation, which is the you know, cold and extreme high latitudes and warm and the low latitudes, the place where water is the densest and able to sink and form the circulation is up here in the North Atlantic and in the South Atlantic. And I just want to kind of emphasize that everything that we talk about with respect to ocean circulation patterns and the carbon cycle and life is totally dependent on this configuration for the ocean. But imagine when we had Pangaea or some other arrangement of continents, um, all of the conditions that allow deep water to kind of form up here and then flow through the ocean basins are dependent on a whole bunch of different parameters which haven't existed in the past, even to the extent we're talking about ice ages. But if you cover this whole part of the North Atlantic with ice, um, put ice sheets here, you cover some part of the Pacific with ice, you change the circulation pattern sufficiently that it has a dramatic effect on the carbon cycle. And we'll talk about how that works um, coming up and also next time, which has a dramatic effect on climate. So that the way in which things operate today and the way we understand them are not the same in the not so distant past, just 10,000 years ago. And if we go back to periods of time when, for instance, there wasn't a continent down here, right? Uh, in the Cretaceous, that also really changes the way the ocean circulates. So that there's a lot about how things work and how we say they um, kind of control planet and the carbon system and everything else, which are very dependent on some particularly um, specific conditions. So I've mentioned before, um, but again, I kind of want to remind you that the oceans are stratified, right? Hot in the top, cold in the bottom. This is how it plays out over average ocean depths, about 4,500 feet. So this is drop in temperatures. We go from the photic zone through the mixed layer into the deep water called the thermocline. There's a corresponding variation in salt content, halocline. You can see it's about one salinity unit. And there's a corresponding difference in density, which we call the technical. This also is deep water circulation, which we've talked about before. I've shown you this slide now several times. I'm not going to be labor. That's a plan view. And this is a side view. Um, ocean currents, blue being deep water currents, uh, red being surface water currents. Those are highly schematic and these green dots being places of return flow as water goes from the Atlantic to the Indian to the Pacific. Uh, it changes composition through the infalling of particles from above, which are primarily driven by photosynthesis and respiration in a net sense. Um, so the carbon, organic carbon associated with these yellow arrows and there's inorganic carbon across the carbon. And so, and we'll, we'll talk about that more, but the first thing I wanna talk about a little bit of these green dots. Okay, so as we go along in the oceans, along that transit, along the conveyor belt, we develop what we call nutrient profiles, right? And these are from the text. These are just a couple of different versions of it. Something that's low in surface water, high at depth, and oftentimes shows a little peak just below the, the sort of floated zone in the mixed layer, right? Sometimes it shows this hump and then comes back down. Sometimes it doesn't. This varies depending on where you are in the ocean basins. But in essence, a lot of what drives this profile is consumption in the upper water column, right? Like organisms taking stuff out of water, so depleting nutrient concentration. Then those organisms die, they fall down through the water column, and the process what we call remineralization, which is a fancy way of saying we're spiring organisms decompose the parts of those particulate matter and put stuff back into the water, right? And so um, if we're relatively um, early on the oceanic transit of deep water masses, right, like if we're in the Atlantic Ocean, then what we can commonly see is the very deepest waters haven't received a full complement of this remineralization. And so what, you, what happens is that we get this hump where the deeper waters are not as enriched as the shallow, shallower part of the where they're, in, they're receiving this increased concentration, what makes it a little bump because of this active process of respiration and remineralization. So we kind of move further along to the ocean basins that deep water masses catch up. And so we sort of lose that, that bump. But 
we call this a nutrient profile, even though a lot of chemical elements don't necessarily, that aren't involved in life, also show them, right? And um, that goes kind of back to the table I showed you last time of the four categories of the elements that we have in the ocean, the conservative ones, which are category one, and categories two, three, and four, which are non-conservative for either being definitely involved with life, they have nutrient profile, and definitely not being in life, although life they don't have nutrient profile, and we're not sure because they're kind of complicated and sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't have nutrient profiles. And like one classic element that shows this, which as far as we know is a toxin, is cadmium, right? It's not a nutrient, it's not used by life, but somehow it gets tied up in the export phenomena that are, are related to these particles being present in the remineralization. They stick on fecal pellets, for instance, they sink down in the sediments. And so they can also have that kind of profile. People talk about nutrient profiles all the time. And so when we look in the oceans at natrate and phosphate, our two primary uh, macronutrients, and we also look at silicon. Anyone know why we might consider silicon? There are some organisms that make shells out of silicon, primarily diatoms and radiolith. And so while it isn't a nutrient per se, the silicon that's in the water gets depleted by the growth of these particular organisms because they're pulling it out to make shells. Uh, and so we get a nutrient profile uh, for them as well. And so you can see here, and I've kind of harped on this before, and I really want to make sure that you, you get that. See how the um, Atlantic profiles got a kind of a bump and then it comes back down, whereas the Pacific and Indian Ocean don't? That's because of this transit of, of water through the system, right? As we go along, we start to get that high concentration just below the photic zone of nutrients on our nutrient profile pretty early on because of this infalling process. But what happens is, is that as we the water masses move along, it takes them about 1500 years to get from here over to here, this kind of yellow arrow starts to affect it deeper and deeper and deeper into the water column. And so we accumulate the signatures of excess respiration over photosynthesis as we go along. Okay, and what does that mean? Higher nutrient content and lower pH, lower pH because of respiration. Okay, so that basically shows up here. And silicon follows along with it, right? So that the deep waters of the North Pacific are the most enriched in the elements of life. This might sound weird, but, or this might be like completely wrong, but I thought that like calcium was what diatoms and other. No, calcium be. is involved in a, the majority of, of phytoplankton that oh, okay. are calcareous, yeah. oculus, um, for instance. Um, so yeah, diatoms are a siliceous um, producing organism as are radiolaria. They, I don't know the stats on what proportion of the total biomass they represent, maybe 10-ish percent of the photosynthetic biomass. So you're right in the sense that calcium carbonate is the main thing. Yeah. The problem is that calcium carbonate chemistry is really, really complicated. And we don't see, for instance, this kind of profile of calcium mm -hmm. because the amount of um, calcium in seawater that is involved in calcium carbonate production relative to the total is small. Whereas the amount of silicon mm -hmm. relative to the total is large because silicon is really soluble. Yeah. Okay. So that's why you get that nutrient profile. So just flip a nutrient profile on its uh, backward, a mirror image, and you get the oxygen profile. Okay. So there's something called the oxygen minimum zone, which we find in the oceans, going anywhere from like maybe four or 500 meters water depth down to about 1.2 with a peak kind of around one. And it depends where you are. Let's say you're in a part of the oceans where it's super biologically productive up above in the shallow water and a bunch of organic matter is raining down. Below that, you're going to have a very high concentration of respiring organisms and the oxygen concentration can get really low. So we go to those biologically very productive regions on the planet like the California current that I was just alluding to, very biologically productive up in the surface waters and it's got a very highly expressed oxygen mineral. We come out here to the center of the Pacific Ocean where we are, so there's not nearly as much biological productivity in the surface water. The oxygen minimum is not nearly as uh, prominent. So that's a difference that we see as we go through the oceans. Can anyone imagine any of you like 
what do you think happens to the deepest water oxygen concentration as we go along the flow transect from, um, you know, this end? I would assume the oxygen is a lot less. Right, it goes down it's for the same reason that the nutrients go up, right? It's just the cumulative effect of respiration. So there's this intricate relationship between the chemicals of life, um, either the, the nutrients or the things that are, you know, involved like oxygen and CO2, I could have put as well uh, in the form of pH, and oceanic circulation. And part of the whole discipline of kind of marine geology, marine sedimentology has been driven by looking at how this has varied in the past. One of the reasons is, is that if for nothing else, we want to understand what were the conditions and at what periods of time were we able to preserve organic matter and sediments, which made petroleum deposits, right? That's been a lot of the kind of driven the exploration of the oceans and so forth. Just from that perspective alone, there are obviously many other things such as climate drivers, biodiversity drivers, um, et cetera, resilience of the ocean with respect to large scale perturbations such as uh, meteorite impacts or air periods of large volcanism. They all have impact on these things. But um, I would say that the reason we know so much about this going back into deep time and comparing deep time with today has to do with. Um, you know, insights gained relative to the petroleum industry. So the things that increase as water flows along that flow path, total CO2 from respiration, nutrient content, silica content, and health um, alkalinity, meaning al alkalinity that's just associated with the carbonate system, right? And that's basically just the addition of CO2. Concentration of oxygen goes down. The, the pH also goes down because the acidity goes up because of the sum of the CO2. Right. So if we go in the oceans, we want to say, all right, you're in the, the middle of the oceans and you want to know, um, you know, kind of where you are. If you take samples of deep water, um, you'll know you're in the North Pacific because you have the highest nutrient content, the highest total CO2 and the lowest dissolved oxygen of the ocean basins. And something more intermediate uh, concentrations will tell you you are somewhere else along along the flow. Okay, so now let's talk about upwelling. So this is this gyroscopic flow again, plan view map of the world's oceans. Those black colored zones are the places where we have significant upwelling. There's two main reasons to get upwelling, um, but the primary form of upwelling that we see today happens, today happens on the eastern sides of ocean basins and is due to the way this gyroscopic flow patterns interact with the continental margin and the Coriolis effect. Coriolis effect is a centrifugal force related to the fact that Earth uh, orbits and uh, or, or around its axis, it rotates around its axis. So it's a deflection. So for instance, the water comes down the coast here um, of California, it's flowing from north to south and it's being deflected by this Coriolis current. That's what these red arrows in this diagram are supposed to represent. So it gets pulled offshore. And when it gets pulled offshore, it gets replaced by deeper water mass. That come up to the surface. So imagine what happens when you take deep water masses that are full of nutrients, depleted in oxygen, high in silica, and you bring them back up here into the photic zone. It's like adding miracle grow to the water. It's like fertilizing it. So this is the reason we get a lot of biological productivity. So if we get a lot of photosynthesis, then we're going to get a lot of respiration too. And we have um, much enhanced ecosystems there. That's why they're popular as fisheries, for instance, because there's so much biological activity happening. So now these are a couple of depth profiles. This is zero to 300 meters. It's really shallow, right? The very top of those nutrient profiles. This is temperature and this is oxygen. And this is with distance offshore through the California current. So, you know, a few hundred kilometers, actually about 150 kilometers. And what you see here is, is that these isotherms, the lines of equal temperature sort of push up, right? So cold water is being brought up. So if we go further offshore, we see warm water extending much further down than we do over here near the coast. And one of the reasons why it's kind of miserable to go surfing in California because the water current, the water is so cold because of this upwelling. And here's that oxygen minimum zone also being pulled up with it, right? So in a relative sense, 
If we go offshore a couple hundred kilometers, we're going to find higher oxygen concentration at 100 meters and 200 meters water depth, like around here, than we will when we come really close to shore. That's the upwelling. So here is a couple of profiles. This goes all the way across the Pacific Ocean, starting in Japan and going over to the California coast. This goes kind of north of the Hawaiian Islands, right? And so this is kind of the trace of the seabed. I've got four of these diagrams that where all of them have the same feature, which is that the top kilometer of the ocean is in this box. And there's a break in scale. And then we have another uh, five kilometers, right? So this little section here, um, you know, basically sits beneath this section. There's no overlap between these diagrams, but this goes one, two, three, four, five, six kilometers. And, and this whole upper kilometer is stretched out, right? So you're seeing more, you can see once you get down here, for instance, in salinity, pretty constant as we go across the ocean. Um, but the two main features that you can see in salinity content, and we'll see the others, is that there's a lot of variation at the top, right, due to the currents and where it's wet and where it's dry, et cetera, et cetera. And we see these, um, you know, contours of equal salt content kind of dipping up, if you will, thinking it as a geologist towards the surface. And this is this process of upload that we see near the coast. This is it in temperature too. See how it's maybe easier. So you see how all these isotherms are kind of moving along and all of a sudden they kind of go upward. That's upload. Once you get down to the oceans, pretty far down, this is all pretty similar pretty much everywhere you go, right? There's the huge variation. This is dissolved inorganic phosphorus, okay? DIP. And again, upwelling shows very high concentrations being brought up into the photic zone. And this is because of kind of a reinforced feedback of upwelling is bringing nutrient rich water up into the photic zone in that zone. We're supporting more life there. So we have um, more trophic levels in our ecosystem and much higher biomass. Those organisms eventually die and come back down and they get remineralized. So that in kind of a cir circular fashion, we start to really enrich nutrients down here and support much more life up there. So we kind of, in a way, kind of trap extra nutrient content in this particular coastal upwelling zone. And it's true for pretty much all of them, just very well expressed in the California current. And finally, dissolved oxygen. So same thing. Oxygen is high because of biological productivity in the surface water and very low in the deep water underneath the upwelling zone, again, because of that enhanced respiration. And of course, right at the surface, oxygen is going to equilibrate with the oceans, with the atmosphere, and it has a set level. But if you just go a little bit down, you know, maybe 50 meters, 100 meters into the water column, any um, extra oxygen is produced by photosynthesis in those waters doesn't necessarily immediately equilibrate to the atmosphere. So we can find super saturation here. So in fact, it was part of, like, for my master's, uh, I worked on oxygen supersaturation in the North Pacific. It was part of of what we worked on and whether or not it was driven by this process or other phenomena. And um, that was an interesting learning experience for me. So this just kind of describes what happens with upwelling, right? But if you think about, okay, so we have these upwelling zones, we've got really intense biological productivity, we've got a lot of particulate matter falling down, lots of organic matter. Sometimes that organic matter makes it all the way down to the seabed and gets buried in seven. And that's what petroleum is. And the conditions that allow that to happen require several things, regardless of when, if we're talking about the modern ocean or we go back in time, we need to have so much carbon falling out of the ocean, uh, probably out of the surface ocean, I should say, that it can't all be respired on the way down. Okay, and so that is promoted by having a relatively shallow seabed, right? Because the longer it falls, the deeper the depth it falls to, the more time it has to be remineralized. Having a shallow ocean basin, restricting water flow, which can, can kind of invest in from the side water masses that might um, help contribute to decomposition of organic matter. So um, having high supply, relatively shallow water and um, restrictions to flow are good conditions for preserving organic matter on the seabed. And, and so for instance, we have places in the world's oceans today, which nearly anoxic in the bottom waters and we do preserve organic matter. And one of those places are some of the basins off of Southern California. 
the Navarro Bay. And that's why California has so much petroleum. Is the conditions that existed now also existed back in the early part of the Paleogene when most of that organic matter was preserved, and there was this subduction zone there that was able to take those organic rich sediments and put them down to the proper pressure and temperature conditions. There's some other places too. This place called Cariaco Basin, which is north of Venezuela in the Caribbean, is another one of these places receiving a lot of organic matter because of conditions in the surface water. In that case, it it's not upwelling from you know uh, circulation patterns. It's more the delivery of nutrients um, off the South American continent into the water column. Um, so that's that's kind of neither here nor there. But but other places where there's upwelling, where the conditions in the um, on the seabed don't promote the preservation of organic matter, we don't have. It. And when you go back into the geological time, you can say, well, why is it that we have so much? organic matter preservation during certain periods of time and not during others. It all goes back to something about what are the currents looking like, what's the configuration of the continents, how deep is the ocean at that particular time in that particular place, and uh, with the kind of relationship, which we'll talk about in a moment, between the amount of carbon that manages to get stored in sediments is directly proportional to the amount of oxygen that we build up in the atmosphere. It takes oxygen to do respiration. Right. And so if you do a lot of extra respiration, you don't preserve carbon in sediments, then you have kind of lower oxygen in the atmosphere. And if for whatever reason you're able to preserve a bunch of carbon in uh, sediments, then you don't consume as much oxygen. We get relatively high oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere. There's one other thing I just wanted to mention about upwelling before we move on, which is, is that the other place where we see significant upwelling are places where currents move against each other. Okay, and this isn't a great diagram to show you it on. Let me go back here. I meant to mention it here. Another place where we have upwelling are in the equatorial regions. And this is not because so much of the Coriolis effect and the relationship with the continents, is that when you have cut currents going by each other, right? Uh, one in one direction, one in the other. You can see here we have something called the equatorial countercurrent. We see it in all ocean basins. So that the way the gyres go is they're basically um, east to west. But right along the equator, a little bit north of it, in fact, uh, there's a countercurrent that flows the opposite direction. We get these two currents kind of going against each other. What happens is, again, it causes some upwelling. So when we look at maps of you know, nutrients and biological activity, we'll see these zones is most prominent in the Pacific Ocean, but you can also see it in the Atlantic and to a lesser extent in the Indian, where you can see the circulation a little bit complicated, where we have this kind of tongue of enhanced biological activity extending out into the ocean. It's because it's again, it's because of upwelling, but it's different than this other style of upwelling. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the marine carbon cycle, which is just you know directly a segue on this. And you know, you can think about the carbon cycle in all sorts of different ways, but I like to think of it as basically four components of the of what makes up the carbon cycle. We have life, and I always divide life, I think what most geochemists do, into photosynthesis and respiration, right? Some organisms are making organic matter, and some organisms are consuming organic matter. It's more complicated than that, obviously, but uh, those are the kind of two end members of the kind of spectrum of life. And then there's the stuff that feeds the life, right? And from the perspective of carbon, there's two types of carbon involved in organisms organic carbon and inorganic carbon. So those are the four things, right? Organic carbon, inorganic carbon, respiring organism biomass, and photosynthetic organism biomass. And driving all of that are these other things, changes in oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, other micronutrients like iron that we've alluded to today, uh, in previous times. We're going to pretty much just focus on the, on the simple stuff. But you can't Think about any one of those things without its relationship to the other. They're all in, uh, inextricably linked. So we want to think about these things and look at how they vary. So as a prelude to, right, we've had four and a half billion years of, of a planet with life, uh, maybe not four and a half billion years, but probably 4.3, 4.35 billion years since the advent of life. Um, and we started to have oceans almost that early on the planet. We'll talk about this evolution later in the semester. But um, we've had a very, very long time 
for Earth to establish um, the system of the carbon cycle and its relationship to things like the configuration of the continents and the way the ocean circulate and ocean volume and climate and all that kind of stuff. And in a short period, um, a handful of decades, so perhaps a century, we humans have completely perturbed it, right? And so everyone's interested in, well, how, how do we fix it? How do we reverse that? And you, you can't change anything about greenhouse gas loading in the atmosphere without understanding the way that we perturb the carbon cycle. That's why we're, we're really, why we're thinking about this, because it's, it's, a, it's like a huge locomotive with many, many train cars behind it, kind of pulling up a mountain um, that drives why we have what we have in different places and how the system operates. And there are leads and lags. Not everything that we change about the atmosphere shows up immediately in these other places, but it is showing up. We can see it showing up. And the magnitudes is just staggering the, no the amount of carbon, for instance, that we have in the ocean in these various forms. And this tiny, tiny bit that we're changing in the atmosphere is perturbing that, right? So it's interesting to think about why, what are the time scales, how will it respond, et cetera. I want to remind you of one other thing. I've shown you this diagram before, too, which is that in the most basic sense, if you look at the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean today, and you can compare it going back into the past, we have you know, nearly 150 million years of sedimentation in the ocean basins. If we go to the oldest parts of the oceans, which for the Atlantic Ocean are the margins just next to the continents, and in the Pacific Ocean, it's basically in the northwestern portion of the ocean basin. We have this characteristic pattern of flow, which hasn't always been the case, where water leaves the Atlantic Ocean in the bottom and goes into the Pacific Ocean and then return flows across the surface. This is obviously a, a gross simplification of that flow pattern, but this hasn't always been the case. But this, what we call basin-to-basin -basin fractionation, which allows us to preserve all of the things that we know of, for instance, the relatively high oxygen concentration, relatively low nutrient content, not as low pH because of respiration in the Atlantic Ocean, also the Pacific Ocean, shows up in the types of sediments that are there related to the carbon cycle. So for instance, with the carbonate rich sediments in the Atlantic Ocean and carbonate poor sediments or silica rich sediments in the Atlantic Ocean, excuse me, in the Pacific Ocean. And part of this is driven by those diatoms and radiolaria and those other um, organisms that produce siliceous shells. Um, but, but to be honest, we have about the same biological productivity in the surface water Right. Um, it's just that this water is more corrosive to calcium carbonate than this water is because the pH is a little bit lower, a little bit more respiration. So it's harder to preserve calcium carbonate sediments in the deep water masses. So this is basically a summary of carbon bearing phases in the ocean. And it's got those same components that I've mentioned before, um, but written out slightly differently. Now I've taken the inorganic carbon and I've divided it up into dissolved and particulate, right? It's still all inorganic carbon, but some of it's dissolved and some of it's particulate, that's all. Okay, then we've also got our, when we take our organic carbon, again, some of it's dissolved, some of it's particulate. The thing about dissolved stuff is dissolved stuff kind of moves slowly with the water currents, where particulates basically fall. And so it's a way of transporting stuff from one place to another. Then we've got our organic carbon, right? That, um, you know, is, uh, like I said, dissolved in particular. Sorry, I already said that. And then we got the living biome. So, um, and, and in this case, I haven't necessarily divided it up into the photosynthesizing organisms or respiring organisms, but I do you know, point that out here, right? We've got the autotrophs and the heterotrophs. When we talk about the oceans, people normally use this term primary producer means they're making oxygen, okay? And this term um, is kind of applied because of the role of the oceans and photosynthesis in the oceans in setting oxygen content on the planet in our atmosphere. Turns out the vast majority of the photosynthesis on the planet happens in the ocean. Right? That's not to discount the contribution from the land because it's significant as well and we would be struggling if we didn't have it, but if we had to pick a single thing that drives oxygen concentration in the atmosphere, it's this. And so the autotrophs in the ocean that produce oxygen 
are thought of as the primary producers of oxygen. This is just a, well, it doesn't show up very well here, but so this is a satellite view and um, you can basically see this kind of swirling area and that area up there. These are areas of high photosynthetic activity. Uh, this is just a particularly nice image that uh, from last year from the, the NASA um, Instagram account that I saw. I was like, oh, I'm going to save that and use it sometime in a lecture. But, but depending on um, you know, how we view the planet, we will find zones with high photosynthesis, zones with less photosynthesis. And the reason I put this picture in here is to illustrate that currents play a huge role in determining the distribution of where and how we have stuff. Currents on the big oceanic scale, currents on the local scale. This is an eddy you know, plate. That's what causes this kind of swirling current. It may not exist there all the time. This is another eddy. But um, there's a lot of interrelationship between you know, how the water masses move, how they gather the conditions that allow them to support photosynthesis, meaning how do they get nutrients? How do they get uh, oxygen and CO2 through exchange with the atmosphere, et cetera, which is driven by temperature, which is largely a reflection of currents in the system. So these things are really linked together. There's no way to kind of pull them apart. And is this thing, you know, the, this is just the text of that Instagram post. You can read it um, whenever you want. But, um, you know, this, this snapshot is seasonal, right? So it turns out that this, this is a summertime snapshot. And it has to do a lot with having the right conditions in the water column um, that occur primarily in the summer to help promote these kind of biological blooms. So this is a map from Burner and Burner, the book that you've been doing some of your reading from, um, that's uh, kind of darkness coded, if you will, for biological productivity, distribution of primary productivity. So you can see here that whether we're talking about hatchard or solid zones, the kind of more intense the color of, of gray and black, the more upwelling there is. And um, so we find some, or excuse me, up on, the, the more biological productivity there. There's kind of two main biological productivity zones in the oceans for primary productivity. One is the extreme kind of northern parts of the ocean basin. It's not, not counting the Arctic Ocean, which is ice covered, or used to be anyway, um, and isn't particularly broad productive, but the North Pacific, the North Atlantic, also the very South Pacific and South Atlantic, and I want you to think about when we talk about density in the oceans and we look at the oceans as being stratified. Um, if you recall, there was places where the isopycnals of lines at equal density, as we move north to south, they kind of approach, they move upward, right? The cold, we get colder and saltier water um, at the surface, being able to exchange with water at depth because of this distribution pattern. And the nutrients that they carry and they support is pr predominantly why we have this kind of higher biological productivity in the high latitudes and lower in the low latitudes. So if we do anything to change the way the ocean circulates, which is related to in the short term, not the configuration of the continents, but how cold is it up here and down here, right? And as we'll talk about with, with respect to climate change, when we drive temperature changes on the planet, what we're really doing is cranking up the temperature over the poles. We're changing the gradient of temperature between the equator and the poles. So we have the risk of changing fundamentally the pattern of which upwelling uh, and stratification of the oceans takes place to perhaps even affect the relative production of oxygen and biological activity that is enhanced in these high latitude zones if we continue on our, on our current path. The other places where you see a lot of biological productivity are places like here, the Cal this I realize it's kind of a weird uh, view, but this is the Pacific Ocean. This is the California current and that upwelling associated with it. We also have lots of biological productivity in the northern part of the Indian Ocean. This is largely due to terrigenous sediments being shed off the Indian subcontinent and all the particles that come with it flowing into the northern part of the Indian Ocean. This is the Bay of Bengal over here. Um, this is obviously the, the uh, Western Indian Ocean going up into the Gulf. This promotes a lot of biological productivity because we're bringing in a lot of particulate into the water. It's the same reason why the Caribbean is relatively uh, productive, right? And this is that Cariaco Basin that was mentioned to you before. So there's multiple reasons why we can have biological, high biological productivity. 
But the key thing that you will see is that the main light colored areas here are the centers of the gyres, like where we live, right? So the, the centers of the large circulation patterns on the planet, they don't really have any source of nutrients. Sorry, there's a lot of going back, but if we go into um, you know, this area or this area or this area, all of the things that could help support photosynthesis through the addition of nutrients, which are either upwelling, supply from runoff from the continents, or a very, very high dust flux. So for instance, you've probably seen in the news, sometimes there's big dust plumes that come off of the Sahara. They, that carries with it particulate matter, which then falls in the ocean and which can help to promote biological productivity. But when we get into the centers of the gyres, for the most part, we get isolated from all the mechanisms through which um, material can be added to the ocean to help support biological productivity. So we have the less of it in the center of the gyres. Okay, so this is kind of a fancier, cooler map that I got from, um, this is like uh, a Japanese, uh, I think, I'm not 100% certain, but I believe it's like the equivalent of our NOAA, but in Japan. And I thought this was a pretty cool infographic. So it basically shows you, here's a satellite view, and this is all of a snapshot, a single day in May, in the springtime, um, chlorophyll, temperature, the amount of light from the sun available to dry photosynthesis, right? Which is just think about it, it's like, where is the earth along its orbit around the sun? And what angle is it facing at the sun? And, so we get more in the northern hemisphere and less in the southern hemisphere, for instance. Temperature is not as dramatic because the water has a lot of thermal um, kind of uh, ability to hold its temperature so that it can stay warm throughout the season, even as incident sunlight varies in low latitudes. In high latitudes, it obviously changes more. And this is the net sum of all those things, which is how much primary productivity right, this biological photosynthesis happens and where, okay? And so we see a few things. We see, um, you know, it's very low in the Southern Hemisphere at this period of time, it's higher in the Northern Hemisphere. We see the gyre, for instance, being low and North and South of it being high. We see these high concentrations of biological activity in the upwelling zones. This is that equatorial countercurrent I was telling you about that also promotes upwelling. And so for the most part, a high biological activity in terms of primary productivity is associated with either the coastal zones or a few places in the um, centers of the oceans, the interiors of the oceans that um, reflect the edges of the gyres. And this obviously changes seasonally, right? If we go into the um, autumn season, then some of this high biological productivity is going to move to, to the southern hemisphere. Okay, so we also have some maps of concentrations of other stuff in the water. This is surface water distribution. This is dissolved inorganic phosphorus. And um, I've kind of just highlighted a couple of contours, red being particularly high and yellow being particularly low. So the gyres are low and the Southern Ocean is high as is um, the Northern part. This is the Indian Ocean, this is the Pacific. This is the Atlantic. I realize these maps are a little bit Hard to see, but you can see here, here's South America, for instance, there's Africa. And so we see this pattern in pretty much all the, uh, the nutrient elements. This is, um, again, the dissolved inorganic phosphorus map now just for the Pacific, right? So North America, South America, Australia, et cetera. And um, again, high, high, high along the equatorial countercurrent and low in the bulk of the gyres. And this is the biomass of animals, respiring organisms living in the surface water, you see that it kind of follows that same pattern, right? And it's because nutrients allow primary productivity to happen. Primary productivity, which basically is food, photosynthetically produced food for respiring organisms, helps promote the um, production and support of an ecosystem that's either, you know, very rich in uh, numbers of animals or very poor in numbers. And that, that extends all the way up to the entire food chain. So if we get like a little bit more technical about this and we just say, well, let's think about the relative reservoir size of the different types of carbon in the oceans, 
Okay. And for now, I'm just going to talk about organic carbon. And we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, um, inorganic carbon next. But if we look at the breakdown in the water, there's way more VOC than POC. Way more, right? 70 to, um, to 2 or like 35 times as much. This is because the POC is always settling and falling out and there's all this. And here's the relative amount of organic carbon that's tied up in a living organism. So we've got our primary producers, right? They're pretty small. We've also got bacteria, some of which, for instance, say our bacteria are producing, are also photosynthesizing, even smaller amount than the amount that are tied up in uh, animals. All of these things are really small, right? They add up something like 24 compared to the organic matter that is not in living biomass was produced by them. like this stuff wouldn't be there if not for the organisms. I think a little bit comes off the continents and we see that in the coastal zone, but when we get out to the center of the ocean, the fact that there's these kind of engines that are churning a small amount of living biomass producing in proportion a relatively high amount of organic carbon is kind of important because think about all the other stuff that organic carbon does, like the chelation, the stuff sticking onto particles. All, all of the other aspects of ocean chemistry, just like the rest of the hydrologic cycle, are dramatically affected by the presence of organic carbon. Okay, so if we look at the relationship between organic and inorganic carbon, right? The organic carbon is primarily driven by this kind of red field ratio expression, right? Where like we got CO2 comes out of the atmosphere, it goes in the ocean, and depending on how much nutrients is present, we're going to make biomass. That's primary production, right? That's red field ratio. Many of those same organisms make calcium carbonate shells, right? So both of these things take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, it dissolves in water, right? That's an inorganic process that's driven primarily by temperature in the surface water. And then some of that carbon gets sequestered in the oceans by life and by the shells of the organisms of life, okay? And um, it turns out that if you were to look at sort of like on average, there's something like 65 times as much carbon in the oceans in these two form, uh, excuse me, these two forms relative to what's in the atmosphere. That's just like the balance approximately. So you would think that all the carbon that we're sticking in the atmosphere with greenhouse gas loading will end up in the oceans, and it's true. The vast majority of it will. It's, it takes time, time that we don't necessarily have. Okay. But so both of these two phases inorganic carbon and organic carbon are associated with organisms, organisms that live up in the photic zone and eventually die and then settle down. And this is the way that they export, if you will, inorganic carbon or PIC and organic carbon or POC to sediments. Okay, and we can say, well, how much, how, how does that happen? What's the relative proportion? And it depends on where you are. It depends on the ecosystem. It depends on the period of time in Earth history and everything else. If you just go out today and you put sediment traps around in the oceans, you just look at what's falling out. Not, not in the coastal zone where we got all these terrigenous particles. Get out in the center of the ocean and measure it at different rates of biological productivity. And what we find is that the particles that are settling when they leave the photic zone before they make that long transit to the bottom have roughly about four times as much organic carbon as inorganic. Obviously, as they're falling down, the organic carbon can be de de decomposed by respiring organisms, and some of the inorganic carbon may dissolve because the water becomes more corrosive with depth. But if you think about it, there's a ratio of you know four to one of organic to inorganic particulate. You can also, and this is going to become important um, later, but what's the relative carbon to oxygen proportion, right? Because as we know. The making of photosynthetic material also produces oxygen. That's the source of a lot of the oxygen in our atmosphere, right? So, and then the decomposition of this stuff lowers oxygen. The amount of oxygen in our atmosphere somehow is linked up to the amount of this that happens, as well as the amount of reverse reaction, the respiration. And so, when we want to do stoichiometry of this process, we like to look at what's the relative proportion of carbon to oxygen in the POC and the PO. <coughs> And then the POC, and this is a very gross average, but it's about one to one, right? There's about, for every mole of oxygen in the POC, there's a mole of carbon. And we go into the particulate inorganic matter for this calcium carbonate, right? CO3 minus the anion, there's three times as much oxygen as there is in, in terms of relative to carbon. So if you were to kind of 
combine this ratio with these two things, you come up with this number of 1.3, which is basically an index of how much oxygen is bound in particulate organic matter to particulate inorganic matter, which becomes important if you go and you want to say, I can't really reconstruct oxygen concentration through Earth history very easily because it's an atmospheric gas. I can look for proxies and sediments. And if I can look at the relative amount of organic to inorganic matter that managed to get preserved there, I can do some kind of mass balance magic to basically say, well, if I ended up having this much carbon there, that means that's that much respiration that didn't happen, which is that much more oxygen which built up in the atmosphere. Times when there isn't much organic carbon in sediments kind of globally in Earth history are times when there's kind of um, less oxygen in the atmosphere because more respiration was happening. In times when there's a lot of organic matter in the sediments, there's times when we could build up oxygen. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's this ratio that people um, think about. And another ratio that's very similar, uh, which is the relative proportion of oxygen consumption by respiration to um, primary produced POC regeneration by respiration. That also happens to have a ratio of 1.3. If you go back to the Redfield ratio equation, and you remember there's like 106 moles of CO2 plus some you know, amount of nitrate and phosphate in a ratio of 16 to 1 produces some algal biomass and 138 moles of oxygen. You take the 138 moles of oxygen and you divide that by 106 moles of carbon, you come up with 1.3. So the relative proportion of oxygen to carbon in um, photosynthesis and respiration is also conveniently or inconveniently the same. And so when we look at oxygen, you know, how it varies in the ocean, we see it basically at equilibrium with the atmosphere and the surface water, sometimes a little bit supersaturated, then generally going down with depth due to an increase in the relative importance of respiration relative to primary productivity, especially when we get out of the photocon. DOC stays roughly the same in the water column. It doesn't really change. It will change a little bit from place to place. Um, directly proportional to the amount of biological productivity that's happening there. The POC settles out, right? So it gets transported to the sediments. And oxygen in the deeper oceans is the lower value than the surface oceans because of respiration. A lot of that respiration has to do with bacteria uh, living on the pellets of material that are falling out of the photic zone that represent the POC. They're kind of continually decomposing it as it goes down. That's what helps put the nitrate and the phosphate back into the water. They can be upwelled and um, reduces the amount of organic matter that makes you success. Okay. So we can think about some really simple um, relationships between the surface oceans and the deep oceans from the perspective of the carbon cycle as well as oxygen, which is that as particles fall down, EOC, that they consume oxygen. Particles don't, obviously, it's respiring organisms. But in a net sense, the more the particles, the more respiration, the more oxygen consumption. There's some other complicated physics here, right? Like very large particles settle much more quickly than very small particles, and they have more time or less time on this transit, as the case may be. But in any event, as particles fall down, we consume oxygen from the water column and we put CO2 back into the water column. Putting CO2 back into the water in water that's basic just means that it gets a little bit less basic. Okay, so if we do anything that enhances biological activity um, in the surface oceans, in theory, we can export some carbon dioxide from the surface water into the deep water, where it may not stay for very long, but just thinking about the way the water masses on the planet kind of migrate and stuff, at least it's down there for a thousand years or so. Right, because that's how long it takes for the water. And so when people talk about uh, sequestration of carbon in a deep ocean, this is in essence what they're talking about, cranking up biological activity and, and then exporting more carbon down into the deep ocean and keeping it there. And it all happens in kind of Redfield ratio proportions. So if we look at the, um, you know, kind of amount, I realize there's a lot of numbers in here. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to summarize various things. The amount of total primary productivity per year in the oceans is this. It's 197 times 10 to the 12 grams of carbon, which is also about 2 times 10 to the 8th metric ton. Look at the total amount of respiration. And this is done by kind of a combination of 
satellite maps of things like chlorophyll and plankton toes that people do where they take a net and they drag it behind the ship and then they look at the biomass that's in there. And they try to relate things like for a typical marine ecosystem, what's the relative proportion of amount of carbon that's there and how is it divided up between primary producers and heterotrophs or aspiring organisms? And how does that relate back to things that we can measure with a satellite like chlorophyll concentration? So these are obviously numbers with a lot of uncertainty. But if you take them at face value, you can say, wow, in today's oceans, on average, there's a little bit more respiration than photosynthesis, right? And if that's the case, we shouldn't be able to preserve any organic matter in settings, right? Because all the falling out primary productivity produced organic carbon, POC, is being remineralized by respiration before it gets to the seabed. And that's true. We happen to be in a period of time where except for these isolated basins close to the continents that have restricted water mass flow and other things, we're not really preserving carbon. And if you think back to like, okay, well, let's go to like uh, periods of time where there's a lot of petroleum reserves stored in marine sediments in the past, those were periods of time where this wasn't true. We somehow had way more of this and or way less of this for us to have organic matter instead. So this is, for instance, a diagram from a paper from last year uh, in Nature Communications, looking at the relationships between organic matter preservation on the seabed and climate-driven circulation patterns between life, last ice age and today, right? And so this, there's a couple of things on here. This goes back to one glacial interglacial cycle. So the last glacial maximum, the peak of the last ice age, was about 25,000 years ago. Okay. The last high stand was about 135,000 years ago. Okay, so there's three things on here. One of them is a way, and we'll talk about this a little bit more coming up in a subsequent uh, lecture, is temperature reconstruction for the deep ocean, which comes out of a delta O18, actually nice topic composition, of deep dwelling organism, benthic foraminifera. So their shells record the composition of the water. And that tells us something about a combination of temperature and circulation pattern, right? And um, that shows a, a small variation um, where it decreases dramatically during the ice age. That's what this is. And there are things as LGM. That's the last glacial maximum. Okay. And now in, uh, excuse me, that's the red curve. The blue curve is how sea level varies, right? So high today, low during the ice age. So, in a way, you can you can think about the delta O18 of the deep water masses as sort of mimicking in a first order sea level. This is only important because someone wants to go into a sediment stack and quickly be able to say, oh, without like doing complicated geochronology, you know, were these sediments formed during an ice age or they formed not during an ice age, and how do they reflect that transition? And so this is one of the ways that, that people have been doing this for like 50 years. Now, this is the total organic carbon content preserved in marine sediments, surficial marine sediments in the uh, um, Atlantic Ocean. Okay, and this is a ratio. It's a ratio of what do we see at any given time to what do we see today, if that makes sense, right? So, um, what you see is that during this ice age, this goes way up. Right? So somehow the preservation of organic matter in sediments goes up by a significant fraction, right? something like a factor of two or two and a half, just by changing the way the oceans circulate between the ice ages and today. And that's a relatively small variation in circulation pattern. But a lot of it is driven by stratification in, uh, in the upper water column, especially when we put a lot of um, cold uh, ice or very cold water in the northern latitude in the Atlantic Ocean, kind of short circuits that circulation pattern that we have. It doesn't allow it to continue to happen. One of the big worries about human induced climate change is, is that when we start to uh, turn up the heat on the planet and we start to melt the ice caps, especially Greenland, we freshen the water in the northern hemisphere. And we freshen the, the surface water, it also um, limits the ability to make deep water. The oceans become more stratified. And when the oceans become more stratified, we preserve more organic matter on, in sediments. And that has a 
fundamental effect on biodiversity in the oceans, fisheries in the oceans, and the way the oceans can regulate carbon in the atmosphere by the rate of circulation. And one of the things that people hypothesized, these weren't uh, present 25,000 years ago to make these measures, but they hypothesized <coughs> that the ocean circulation was really fundamentally different. Instead of being this long transit, there was a lot more kind of vertical upwelling and mixing throughout the ocean basins that was happening at that period of time. And um, it had a lot of a lot of different kinds of impacts, including how much organic matter to go to study. You know, there's other things you could do too, like you can you can go into the literature and find examples where people look at this pattern. Well, how did it change over the Paleogene? Or how was it different between you know when we had a supercontinent and, and now? How is it different when we didn't have a um, land mass over Antarctica and now? In all of those cases, we see variations in this preservation index. And that's you know all related to the interrelationship between biological activity and ocean circulation. So if we kind of break down the photosynthesis and the respiration, right? Like where's it happening? What area in the ocean is it happening? And um, how complicated are the ecosystems and everything else? What we find is, is that between the three kind of I'm dividing up the oceans into the open ocean, the coastal zones, and the coastal zones that have upwelling. Okay, even though there's very little in a net sense per square kilometer of sea surface photosynthesis that happens in the open ocean, the main, the centers, and the gyres, because there's so much area there, it still accounts for the majority of the primary cycle. Okay, um, and so you can see how much of the kind of photosynthesis happens in the upwelling zones. Um, and if you look here now at the amount of respiration, you see a very different pattern. Most of that happens in these uh, large upwelling zones and or coastal zones without upwelling. Very little of it happens in the centers of the ocean. So um, in, a, in an area sense, there's a lot of biological productivity in the centers of the gyre, but the concentration is relatively low and you can't support large animal communities. So most of the marine organisms that we find doing respiration, do it in the coastal. And that's why we look at satellite images, you see the water looks fundamentally different in color. You get these very deep blues in the center of the oceans because the biomass is, is so much lower. Okay, so now we're talking about inorganic carbon. There's a couple of things that are important. One of which is, what is the chemistry of calcium carbonate solubility with them? Okay, calcium carbonate comes in two forms, calcite and aragonite. They have slightly different properties as listed here. These are their solubilities at saturation as a function of temperature and pressure. And both phases are a little bit funny in that they become more soluble at high pressure, deeper in the ocean. That's unusual. Most chemicals become less soluble, most salts, in water as pressure goes up. But they happen to vary that way. And um, they also have a kind of a funny temperature dependence in the sense that they become more soluble as the temperature goes down. So the solubility product of calcium carbonate goes up as temperature goes down and goes up, up as pressure goes up. So in a net sense, calcium carbonate gets easier and easier and easier to dissolve as you go down in the ocean. Whether you're talking about this form or this form. Now, if you look at the relative difference between these numbers, this tells us that aragonite is more soluble in water than calcium. So there are some organisms that make aragonitic shells. Their shells dissolve more easily. After those organisms die and the particles start to fall down, they dissolve more easily because the oceans can support a higher concentration of calcium carbonate relative to aragonite dissolution than calcium could do. So it turns out the places that we find aragonitic shells on the seabed, there's one main form of primary producers that make aragonitic shells of pteropods. Corals also do it, but you know, they make kind of reef structures that stay in place. But in terms of open ocean marine sediments, it's driven primarily by pteropods, whereas the calcite, primarily driven by foraminifera um, in their shell. We're going to find better preservation in marine sediments of this stuff than this stuff because this isn't quite as soluble in the ocean. Okay. So when we look in the oceans with depth, okay, going down in the oceans, surface water, deep water, and think up over here, this is 
what we find in terms of preservation state of foraminifera in surface sediments at different depths, foraminifera make calcium carbonate shells. We find that there's more and more corrosion as we go deeper down. So in the upper water column, since there's virtually no dissolution in transit, right? And then we get down to the deeper waters, it get, becomes easier and easier to dissolve foraminiferal tests, calcium carbonate shells. Kind of the opposite when we look at organisms that produce shells out of silicon, like radiolarin. So it turns out that in the oceans, silicon solubility is more traditional. It's higher at high temperature and low pressure, unlike calcium carbonate. So the place where we have preservation issues of silicious shells on the seabed are mostly in the shallow water. So there's a condition that people look at, which is what is the saturation state of water relative to calcium carbonate solubility? This is mostly uh, commonly done for calcite instead of aragonite. You can do it for either, but when people talk about that's the Greek letter omega, the omega of the oceans are usually talking about calcium carbonate uh, in the form of calcite. And what you find is that if you were to look at the chemistry and just, you know, calculate relative to the solubility product, you can find the upper ocean water column is super saturated with respect to calcium carbonate production and undersaturated at depth with respect to calcium carbonate production. And where this comes from, omega is basically looking at the actual concentration of calcium carbonate in water and dividing it by the solubility product. Right? So if the amount predicted by the solubility product is what we find in the water, we get a ratio here of one and we get 100%. It's like exactly what we expect. And if we measure more in the water than we expect from equilibrium, then we come up here and as we get deeper, it gets lower. And you might say, well, well why, why, why would it just be saturated? And it's because um, the way biological productivity and um, takes place and the rates at which things happen and the rates at which cell, shells decompose because you've got the organic coatings and everything else give us a condition where uh, we have more calcium and carbonate in water in the surface oceans than we would expect from pure inorganic equilibrium. Organisms are playing around. Okay, and so if you think about the total dissolved carbon or the alkalinity, right, which you, you all know what alkalinity is now, um, and we look at how that varies in the oceans. In the surface oceans, it varies a little bit. The amount of carbon varies a little bit between whether the water is warm or cold because of the solubility effect. It doesn't really affect the alkalinity. But when we start that transit, when we go from the deep Atlantic down into the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, we see that the total organic carbon goes up and the alkalinity goes up, even though the pH goes down. So these are a couple more plots of some different ways of calculating omega um, from different indicators. Um, and I think that the key point being here that regardless of which way we calculate this, if we look at oceanic depth and we look at total CO2 and total alkalinity, they're pretty constant throughout the ocean basin. There's some deviations up in surface water for the photosynthesis and respiration. And this saturation curve has some, has some complications to it, but it basically it drops very low at the start of the oxygen minimum zone, comes up again, and then goes down. And this is again due to that sort of high concentration of remineralization that's happening, um, you know, in the oxygen minimum zone, excess respiration, making a little bit more acid, making water a little bit more um, corrosive to the ship. Okay. So um, when we think about photosynthesis and respiration and how we link together the inorganic and the organic carbon cycle, we have to think about several things, right? We know we have this ratio of four to one, right? But we know when we have photosynthesis making organic matter, right? We are consuming hydrogen ions. We know we're a little bit less acidic. Respiration makes it a little bit more acidic. When we take calcium carbonate out of water, we liberate a little bit of hydrogen and we make the water a little bit more acidic, right? So photosynthesis makes water a little basic, respiration makes water a little bit acidic. Since we have four times as much organic carbon as inorganic carbon in a net sense, the photosynthesis making the water a little bit more basic beats out the 
production of calcium carbonate, making it a little bit more acidic, right? And then everything that happens during respiration is the exact opposite, right? Respiration makes it a little bit more acidic from this relative to the basicity that's induced by dissolving um, calcium carbonate. So the preservation of calcium carbonate on the seabed is something that people can look at from a variety of different ways. And we can look at it either in the calcite or the aragonite form. And if we're looking at um, a binary thing of like present or not present, which is something that we call the you know above and below the CCD, the carbonate compensation depth, we're looking at the end point of a process through which relatively complicated particles with organic matter and inorganic matter fall from the surface water down to depth and ultimately completely dissolve the calcium carbonate, right? But there are all sorts of other indices that tell us how corrosive the water masses are without completely dissolving the calcium carbonate. They involve getting shells and looking at them under the microscope and seeing various horizons in the ocean basin relative to the saturation horizon, the place where omega equals 100%. And again, this is one of these things that looking at calcium carbonate shells and the relative proportion of them in sediments and reconstructing the sediments of, in a paleogeographic sense, you know, we can drill the ocean basins and say, well, at this period of time, the ocean looked like that, it was at this latitude, and this depth, and everything else. It tells us about what's happening up in the upper water column with photosynthesis and respiration, as well as what's happening as those particles transit through because of the deep circulation and geographic variations preserved in marine sediments basically tell us how is the carbon cycle behaving at different times in the past. All by this really simple index of uh, you know, saturation and everything else. So I think what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll stop there and we'll pick up this conversation next time. <clears throat> but I think you've all heard of this compensation depth before, right? Is that not something new? Okay. So this is the, uh, like I say, it's the ultimate um, kind of recorder of deep water mass corrosiveness of calcium carbonate. But I want you to kind of think about the fact that just like a snow level, right? Like you can be above freezing and still accumulate snow on the bottom, on, on the ground, if you have a lot of snow coming out of the sky. Like it takes time to melt. If you get a little bit of snow and, and it's warm on the ground, it'll melt. But if you get a big, huge snowstorm, you can preserve snow on the ground, at least for some period of time. The same thing with calcium carbonate sediment. So under places of very high biological productivity, think upwelling zones, especially where there's so much stuff falling out of the water column, we can kind of overwhelm the rate of dissolution and still preserve calcium carbonate on the seabed because there's a big supply. And this is one of the things that people look at, which is to say, well, you know, places where we shouldn't be preserving calcium carbonate, like the deep Pacific uh, Ocean, northern Pacific Ocean basins, and we do have it, it's not because the, probably the water mass became more or less corrosive, because biological productivity in the surface ocean is cranked up for a period of time. When it cranks up, we get like a lot of extra snow accumulation on the ground. But when we go and look in those shells at the details of them, which we'll start talking about next time, we can see that the shells are starting to be corroded. They've lost some of their ornamentation. They don't look as pristine because the water is so corrosive, it just hasn't completely dissolved. All right. So I know I covered a lot of stuff. Um, are there, do you have any questions about any of that? Okay.